Привет. Мне кажется, что эта лекция была прекрасна. Мы узнали намного больше, чем о будущем физике. Мы узнали вообще о будущем науке. А у нас есть время на вопросы. В зале есть два микрофона с одной и с другой стороны. И я просил бы задавать вопросы обязательно по-русски, если вы говорите по-русски. Это будет время на английский. И коротко, и по одному вопросу. То есть не задавать сразу несколько, а позвольте. Пожалуйста. В общем, все, что говорилось, конечно, это хорошо. Но истинно несколько вынул, потому что забыли про Альберта Эйнштейна, а именно о связи электромагнитных и гравитационных сил. Ведь что не хватало? Ведь не хватало их связать. И тогда фактически мы могли бы говорить, когда говорится о, о, о том, из чего состоит электрон, какая связь между всеми частицами. Вот чем страдает вся современная физика? Вот квант, вот литро, вот мотор. Это один. Вопрос очень простой. Он касается, что современная физика, вот первый парадокс, касающийся вот парадокс квантов. Масса, общая масса квантов оказывается выше, чем масса протона. Почему? Известна известная формула Луи Дюбчарова. Вопрос. Вопрос. Ну вопрос, ну нету связи, нету связи, ну нету связи у вас, у меня она есть, вот здесь, вот здесь она у меня есть. Давайте да. сделаем еще раз. Спасибо. Ну, давайте сделаем. Можно, можно. Если у вас есть вопросы, мы можем их задавать. Ну, давайте Следующий вопрос, пожалуйста. Действительно вопрос. Я получил замечательное удовольствие от лекции. Правильно я понял, что у темной материи Е не равняется МЦ квадрат. Первый вопрос. Для темной материи и для темной энергии она одно в другое не переходит, в отличие от той физики, в которой я живу. Это правильно. Так энергия темной энергии не из So most of the energy, most of the stuff we observe are particles, which have energy and momentum if they're moving. And uh, even what we call radiation in the end is made out of particles, quanta of light, photons. Dark energy is like the energy and pressure, energy and pressure of a substance, which as I try to explain, is rather strange. It, if it were particles, it would be like the ether and it wouldn't look the same to all observers, no matter what inertial frame they were in. So this is a kind of substance that is not made out of particles, not made out of matter, a substance which has energy and pressure. The pressure is negative. And the reason that the dark energy pressure causes the universe to have accelerated expansion is because of the negative pressure. Now, um, that, in fact, can arise in, and according to everything we expect, in quantum mechanical relativistic systems, because the fluctuations, the quantum vacuum, will have energy, and it must also have this negative pressure in order that it look the same to all observers. In a relativistic theory, that is the only form of energy and pressure that the vacuum could have. Otherwise, there would be a preferred frame of reference. Particles have a preferred frame of reference. If 
you have a bunch of particles, there is a preferred frame where the particles are at rest. And every other observer moving with a velocity sees those particles moving. That would contradict our experimental tests of special relativity. So, if there is an energy in the vacuum, in space, it has to be of this very special nature. And that is what we see. What the astronomers see is not just the energy, they see energy and pressure with precisely the right ratio to tell them that there is no preferred frame. There is no special observer at rest. Every observer, no matter what velocity they're moving, sees the same expansion of the universe, the same energy and negative pressure. Thank you very much. <clears throat> What is your opinion about the symmetry group of great unification theory? Какое ваше мнение группе симметрии великой теории объединения? We don't know. We have clues. If you take, if you take the forces we understand and the particles we observe, they remarkably remarkably fit together in a very simple, unified, bigger symmetry group. The simplest being a group called SU5. It's even nicer in a slightly bigger group called SO10. It's also nice in a group called E6. You can always make the group bigger, but then of course that bigger symmetry is broken, is not manifest. And so the ultimate symmetry is not known. The only way to know it would be to have a more precise understanding of the physics and the breaking of the symmetry uh, than we have today that would allow us to make specific predictions and test what the symmetry group is. But the amazing thing is how well the different parts of the standard model, these three forces, fit together in a, lar in a very simple and beautiful extended, larger symmetry group. So we still believe that one of those groups will play a fundamental role. SU5, SO10, E6, E8, but exactly how requires much more understanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. Спасибо за лекцию. Вопрос такой. Как вы относитесь к тому, ваше мнение по поводу пространства, непрерывная однородная с флуктуациями, либо решетка? Спасибо. Thank you. Well, I strongly believe that it is not fundamental, uh, as I suggested, uh, but, but not in a simple way like a lattice. So, um, in the past, when people speculated about uh, the that space at very short distances might not look like the continuous, differentiable manifold that we typically assume, they thought, well, maybe there's a granular structure. I think what we're being led to now is something very different. And we indeed have examples of formulations of string theory or quantum gravity where there's a totally different
fundamental representation in which space emerges not in the way that a continuum emerges from a lattice or a granular structure, but more in a dual fashion, sort of like, uh, you know, those pictures of a, a vase and two faces, where when you look at it one way, you see two faces, and you blink your eyes, you see the vase. That's, there's no way of describing one version space in terms of the other in any simple fashion. So it's hard for me to, without going into specifics, to describe how space emerges as a concept in that way, in that dual description. But that is what our growing understanding of quantum gravity and string theory suggests. And that understanding has, has produced many interesting results in our understanding of gravity, of black holes, and actually of ordinary condensed matter physics. We have dual descriptions in theories with more space and gravity of phenomena in less space and no gravity. With different ways of looking at the same thing. What is likely to be more fundamental is not the one that is based on the simple space-time continuous manifold. Спасибо. Поднимите, пожалуйста, руки, кто вообще еще хочет задать вопрос, чтобы мы оценили. Молодой человек, пожалуйста. Здравствуйте. Спасибо за лекцию. Я хотел задать вопрос. Знакомы ли вы с интерпретацией теории всего на основе алгебры Ли? И если знакомы, как они, каким образом, если сравнивать с теорией струн и с теорией, более похожа на правду она или нет? Спасибо. Well, I'm not sure what the algebra theory you're referring to. M, M theory is a different matter. It's one corner of string theory. Um, that I'm familiar with. But I'm not sure what the question is. Хорошо, тогда, тогда мы перейдем к следующему. Здравствуйте, Дэвид, спасибо за лекцию большое. А у меня вопрос немного не по существу. А, можно узнать, какие программы используются в расчетах взаимодействий а, между а, ну, квантовых взаимодействий и взаимодействий между частицами? Спасибо. Какие программы? Well, you know, depends on the question. QCD, the theory of the nuclear force, allows you to calculate the masses of the particles that you're made out of. Put these quarks together, um, and you can calculate the masses. Now, those calculations are not done with pencil and paper. They're done by massive computer uh, Monte Carlo calculations of infinite dimensional integrals. So I can write down the answer as an infinite dimensional integral, but it's hard to calculate an infinite dimensional integral, and people approximate that by a million dimensional integral, and then they numerically calculate the million dimensional integral by doing uh, Monte Carlo integration. There are much harder problems than calculating, and that we've done, people have done. There are hundreds of people who do such computer numerical calculations of the properties of, of quarks using ordinary computers. It turns out that a much harder calculation is to calculate the properties of ordinary matter that is high, 
that uh, leads to high temperature superconductivity, for example. There, those methods, computer methods of numerical integration don't work because one isn't integrating a positive quantity. There are lots of cancellations. And in many quantum problems, the computing, nobody has the, knows how to overcome that problem. That's a typical problem that is beyond the capability of, as far as anyone knows, of any classical computer. It's one of the reasons that physicists, physicists are so interested in quantum computers because they could use them to calculate the properties of quantum systems that classical computers cannot calculate. Luckily, for the spectrum of the strong interact of the strong nuclear force, that's an easy problem, amazingly enough. Микрофон, пожалуйста, микрофон. Какие ближайшие проблемы, которые профессор будет заниматься вот в эти годы? Ближайшие. Well, I mean, whatever can be solved in the nearest future. The um, problems I'm most interested in have to do with the ones I talked about at the beginning. That's my field, really. But some of those problems are very difficult. And so every once in a while, I think about easier problems that have a chance of being answered in the, for, you know, in the near future. There are many, many other problems I didn't mention. It's very hard to predict when a problem will be solved, of course, and that's the excitement of physics. Of course, we don't know how difficult a problem is. So my strategy actually is always to think about impossible problems, but also have some other problems to work on at the same time that aren't, I know, are not impossible. And when I get too depressed by not being able to answer the impossible problems, I work on the possible problems. I definitely believe in QCD. <laughs> Well, that's a very good question. Uh, you saw that we have this clue that the forces might be the same if we look at very short distances, very high energies. And we know that the universe very early on in its history was very dense and very hot. So, if the forces indeed unify, it's very likely that though at very high energies, very hot universe, very dense universe, it's likely that uh, they would look the same. And uh, when people try to follow the early history of the universe, that's part of the theoretical model. Uh, but since we don't truly understand unification yet, and have it well tested, it's hard to say. 
what uh, we know and are beginning to explore experimentally that if you take a proton, these quarks which are held together, and you heat it up to about 100 million degrees centigrade, it will melt into quarks. And the quanta of the glue that holds the quarks together called gluons. That's what QCD tells you, the theory. Now we do experiments where we see that happening. Now, how do we heat protons to 100 million degrees? Well, what we do is collide gold atoms, or lead atoms, at very high energies, and we create a fireball, a very hot fireball of protons, which stay together for a very short time, but long enough for the protons to melt. And we create something that is called the quark gluon plasma, a plasma of quarks moving freely, no longer confined. And that has been observed, and the properties of that quark gluon plasma are being measured. It's a fascinating subject that's done at, uh, in the United States and now at CERN, at this lunch at the LHC. The universe in its early stages was that hot. So we know that back then, quarks were deconfined. Later, as the universe expands, it cools off and the quarks become confined inside protons. And later, just before that picture of the universe, at the electrons and the nuclei combine to form atoms. And the universe then is filled with neutral objects, and so light can propagate freely. And that's why we see that picture of the radiation from way back then. What happened before there were quarks and electrons? We don't know. But there is a theory, inflationary theory, which explains, as many successes in explaining the details of that microwave background, which says that before this hot fireball of quarks and electrons, there was a very rapid expansion of the universe due to some other particle, some other field, which then, when it relaxes, turns into, decays into all the kind of matter that could exist at these very hot energies. Electrons, positrons, quarks, antiquarks, photons, everything. And then the mystery is, why don't they annihilate? Why are we left with this small excess of quarks and electrons? And that was the question I asked that Andrei Sakharov tried to explain. And we believe that his explanation was correct. But we don't understand enough of the details to calculate how many excess protons and electrons would be left. And so that's a big challenge. And until we can calculate and test that idea of Sakharov's, uh, we don't know whether that's correct explanation or not. But roughly what we would imagine, speculate, believe, is that start with no quarks, no electrons, expanding universe, all that energy of expansion is turned into matter. That process we can understand. Matter and antimatter, and in this process, most of it annihilates, a little is left over of quarks, electrons, the quarks become protons and neutrons, 
the electrons with the nuclei become atoms, and from then on we understand everything. Спасибо. У нас еще есть время на два вопроса из зала. У нас как-то эта страна более активна. Вот сзади молодой человек тянет руку. о вашем отношении к экспериментам недавним на опера, в которых якобы наблюдались скорости нейтрина больше, чем скорость света. Спасибо. So I'll bet you a hundred rubles or a thousand if you wish that the experiment is wrong. Now why? Well, it contradicts all of our theories which works so well and makes so many predictions. But more importantly, it contradicts other experiments. The, the most remarkable experiment that it contradicts is the observation of neutrinos coming from an, a star that exploded in a faraway galaxy uh, a few hundred thousand years ago that we observed in 1987. So in 1987, a supernova was observed, and 18, minute, 18 and a half minutes before the light was observed, a burst of neutrinos was detected in three neutrino detectors. As we expect, if a supernova, we expect that particles Photons, light will be um, produced, and neutrinos. And the neutrinos should get here earlier than the light, not because they travel faster than light in vacuum, but because in the supernova explosion, the light is slowed down. It travels at a lower velocity in matter, and neutrinos just go through matter. So the neutrinos got here 18 minutes before the photons, before the light. But if the opera experiment were correct, and neutrinos travel that much faster as they claim than light, the neutrinos would have gotten here three and a half years earlier, not 18 minutes, which we understand. So that's a direct contradiction. We have measured by that supernova explosion the velocity of neutrinos to 10,000 times better than the upper experiment. Well, it's not the same experiment. Maybe neutrinos travel at the speed of light in space, empty space, and in matter, underground, through rock, they travel faster. Maybe. I doubt it. And uh, we will know that this group has not yet submitted their paper for publication. They're not so sure. Their paper hasn't been reviewed or published. And in any case, people are now going to repeat the experiment. There is a Similar, exactly the same kind of experiment can be done at Fermilab in the United States by uh, a group called Minos, and will be done. And it'll take some time, years perhaps, one or two years, until uh, we have more evidence. But I'm willing to take a bet. 50, I'll give you better odds. Спасибо. Еще один вопрос, пожалуйста. Если можно, вот сюда, в первом ряду, молодой человек. Нет, если можно, молодой человек. Немного смешной вопрос. А могут ли сталкиваться Вселенной и окружают ли нас остатки других Вселенных, которые уже расширились для состояния отдельных атомов? Well, as... So people speculate... Uh that we are just a small part of a multiverse. Other so-called universes exist now. This has problems because um, 
Those universes, we can't communicate with them. But maybe they collide with us. And you can discuss such possibilities. Uh, and people have looked for evidence. There would be evidence. Uh, you look at that microwave background I showed you, is completely homogeneous. Nothing funny happens anywhere. Uh, if you try to understand such a thing as colliding universes, that is a violent change to the geometry at the collision point. And if it happened within the 17, 13.7 billion light years that we observe, we would have seen evidence. So far, there is no evidence. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen in a year from now, or in a billion years, or that the evidence is so difficult to observe that we haven't yet seen it. But certainly, at the moment, there's no such evidence. Which makes it difficult for me to talk about these other universes, which we can't communicate with and are not causally connected to us. I find it too much, too metaphysical. Спасибо. Наше время подходит к концу. Я хотел бы задать еще один более-менее философский вопрос для завершения. А, Дэвид, а, скажите, пожалуйста, как вы считаете, насколько открытие физики последних десятилетий приблизили нас к состоянию, когда мы можем сказать, что мы более-менее понимаем, как работает этот мир? Или же наоборот, они только вскрыли всю глубину дополнительного знания, которое еще предстоит получить? Both at the same time. That's how, that's what happens to science. The more we know, the more we know we don't know. So, you know, 20 years ago, it's quite a, you know, 80 years ago, uh, people thought that the Milky Way was the whole universe. And they thought it was unchanging and static, eternal. And all of what we've learned in the last 80, 80 years, which is the one person lifetime, we now know that the universe is this much faster with tens of billions of galaxies. And, and it's expanding, and it started from a very condensed state. And we can trace the history and understand how all of this we learned in 80 years, and yet, in the last 20 years, we learned about dark matter and dark energy, and now we have all these new questions about the Big Bang and the end of the universe. And so the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. And that's always been the story of science. The two go together. Knowledge, and one of its most important products, ignorance or new questions and that will probably go on for a long time we'll learn more and more and we'll realize how many more questions there are to ask that's why what makes science so exciting спасибо большое я думаю это завершение буду считать оптимистичным спасибо профессор угроз спасибо всем вам что пришли Спасибо вокруг света, политеку, фонда Династия.